Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Abby Investors YouTube channel. My name is Courtney Richardson. I'm the founder of the Abby Investor. And today I wanted to talk about the seven streams of income. I've noticed a lot of conversation going on online and everybody has an opinion and you know they're like the average millionaire makes seven has seven streams of income and that's what I'm trying to get and it's like first of all you don't need seven streams of income to be a millionaire actually um and I'm going to share with you one of my with my one of my mentors said you know the riches are in the niches so if you focus on like focus will take you so far so if you focus on one stream of income and really focus on it and focus on maximizing them outside of your earned income because i want to talk about that you know millionaire is status is very uh possible um, when you look at warren buffett when you look at bill gates when you look at all these other people there's one thing they focused on and they diversified out i mean shoot even looking at jay-z and beyonce but beyonce focused on her business and on her craft and then she was able to invest in other things same thing with jay-z same thing with nas they focused on their business they focused on their crafts and then from that business from that craft they were able to uh, put money in other endeavors so again focus 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 don't be all over the place because you don't get anywhere i mean it's kind of like your hamster on a wheel but that's not telling you to not expand what you're doing so if you have a business and you write a book that supports your business that's not something that's outside um that's so far out but if you're like oh i drive uber oh i do hair oh i do all these other things it's like ah just focus on one thing and focus on the thing that makes you the most money okay um and fulfills you the most i mean it's not always about money but i wanted to share with you the seven streams of income exactly what they are how they work because again on the internet um there's a lot of stuff out there <laughs> it's not always right and i really but you know pride myself on giving you the right information the best information and good some really good explanation so we're gonna do that today and um yeah So of course it just takes me forever to pull up the screen, which is fine. Um, but um, so basically we're gonna talk about all the seven streams of income and we're gonna walk through each one um, as they stand. So seven streams of income, this is what they are. Earned income, interest income, royalty income, rental income, profit or business income, dividend income and income from capital gains. I'm gonna go through those again. And actually, I have an ebook for you in the show notes because I want you to know it. I want you to understand it. And, I, and you're probably going to want to like revisit it as you kind of go ahead in your personal financial journey. Earned income, interest income, royalty income, rental income, profit or business income, dividend income, and income from capital gains. Okay, what is all that? So the first thing, earned income. So this is a picture of me arguing from the West Virginia Supreme Court back in the day when I was a little young, scrappy thing. Um, <laughs> so earned income is money that you receive uh, from working a job or actively working in your business. So if you're an employee, you're going to receive at the end of the year at tax time, which is like right now, you should be receiving your W-2s. I believe you should, they should be mailed by your employer no later than January 31st. Um, so you should be receiving those in the mail. But if you're an independent contractor, you get a 1099. There's a big debate between what an employee is and what a 1099 employee, employee ugh, independent contractor is. But I'm not getting into that today because we'll be here for 20, 30 minutes. And I'm not really sure we'll have a great resolution because this is actually one of the things that are being litigated in the courts, especially with the, what we call the gig economy between Uber and Lyft and other kind of... Um, you know, independent contractor setups that may not be based on the definition of an independent contractor, an independent contractor. And if you're an, if you're a business owner, you don't really want people to be classified as an employee because you have to pay benefits, you have payroll, you have to withhold taxes. But if you have somebody who is an independent contractor, you don't have to do any of that. You just give them the money and they kind of go about their way and figure out their taxes on their own. So, and fill up, figure out their obligations on their own also, which is including benefits. So I share that with you to say like kind of that's the, the great divide so if you're in a, you're working for someone you want to be considered an employee and if you're you're an employer you want to be have your workers be considered um, 
independent contractors. So that's kind of the great divide, not getting into that, but let's move on. Interest income. So interest income is money that you receive as payment for lending someone money. So if I lend you $100 and I'm like, all right, you can pay me back in a month, but I need 120, you know, I'm getting a 20% of interest income. Uh, but also, when you have savings accounts, like my grandparents used to give me savings accounts um, every single Christmas, and I believe also for my birthday. So I would get those, and um, you know, it's an obligation of the United States government. And over time, is that they would buy it at half base value. So what that means is they would buy it at twenty five dollars, and then I think over twenty five years, some ridiculous amount of time, it would double, and it would become whatever the face value was. Um, also bonds. So you can get bonds. Like I said, we talked about, um, I talked about government bonds You from the federal government. You can get um, T notes, treasury notes. There's a lot of different things. Treasury bonds, there's a lot of different things that you can get. Um, the most common are savings bonds. Um, but also corporations have bonds, like they will issue bonds and bonds are just basically debt. So basically we're lending you money and then at the end of the day, the corporation or the government is supposed to pay you back with interest. So that's your interest income. And then you have your peer to peer lending. So, you know, if I go through, you know, Fundrise, um, not Fundrise, I'm sorry, Lending Club or something like that, then um, that is peer to peer lending. And whatever I get off of my peer to peer lending is going to be my interest income. And we'll talk about the tax implications of all of these in a second. So royalty income. Royalty income are payments that you receive from your copyrights. So anything that you have that you have allowed someone to use from your brain or allowed someone to use from something that you own, like your natural gas resources, it's going to be royalty income. So little fun fact, I used to be an oil and gas attorney um, in West Virginia and southeast, southwestern, excuse me, Pennsylvania and Ohio. So I would set up royalty income tables and um, the common royalty income from oil and gas is one eighth, but it could be more, but the common like standard is one eighth royalty. Um, but like if you have a book and you allow somebody to use something from it, if you have a book, create, like if you have a song, excuse me, um, any other creative work that you allow someone to use, um, you get your royalty income. And then you have your rental property. I think everybody talks about rental property and it's income received from a rental um, after expenses are paid. So I just kind of gave you as an example because I can give you numbers all day and you're like, what on earth, Courtney? So, um, so basically you have $2,000 you receive in your monthly rent and you have, we'll say $750 in monthly expenses. So that would be maybe your property taxes, your insurance, you know, just general maintenance, whatever. So you have um, 1,250 net income. So that's gonna be your rental income is at $1,250. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that because there's depreciation that goes on when you're involved with a rental property or a property that's held for investment purposes. But again, like that's another topic that we're not gonna get into today because like I said, we'll be doing this all day. So we also have profit or business income. Um, income received the result of a business. Um, and I really, really like talking about this because profit or business income, a lot of people, that's where a lot of people make their money. A lot of entrepreneurs and just business owners generally make their money through their business because it's not necessarily that you're exchanging out dollars for hours like when you have earned income. It's you're providing some kind of product some kind of service, something to the marketplace, and hopefully you're able to scale it so you're able to um, really over and above what you're actually putting into it. So like I said, over and above will say cost of goods. So you get $1,000 in sales, you have five, $500 in terms of cost of goods, now you have $500 profit. So that's kind of the way business income works. There's a lot more to it. Like we, we can talk about deductions all day, every day, but that's not necessarily what we're gonna do, but just, just as a general, idea of how this works because again some of us don't even have a general idea of how this works and we end up you know playing the game wrong i tell people you have to learn the rules of the game and play it better than anyone else but if you are on a football field expecting to hit a home run you're going to have a bad situation got it all right let's move on dividend income i love dividend income so dividend income is a distribution of earnings to shareholders of stocks mutual funds or exchange traded funds etfs that can be taken in cash or reinvested dividend income really simple. Um, so I, if you know me personally, or you've even been following me for a little bit, I have a real serious problem with Starbucks. Now I have moved on to the Starbucks K-Cups. Okay. So I'm not getting a, and my, this is my drink and you can ask anybody about it. I'm not getting a grande caramel macchiato, extra caramel, extra whip, five pumps of vanilla anymore. 
Um, I basically get a K-cup, I make my bulletproof coffee. And if you know anything about bulletproof coffee, I put a table a little bit more than a tablespoon, tablespoon of butter, tablespoon of MCT oil, and um, a half, excuse me, a fourth cup of heavy whipping cream, and um, a little bit of Lakanto sweetener. So that's what I do for my Bulletproof coffee. Um, I guess I probably would share that with guys with you in the show notes if you care. I don't know. Anyway, dividend income. So um, I own Starbucks stock. I don't own that many shares, but in May of 2019, um, I got a dividend of 36 cents per share and I reinvested it. I just put it more into, I just buy more stock with it. So I was able to get like 0.05 shares of Starbucks. And I actually, it's so funny. Um, I never even looked at my dividend, my dividends in that way until I started like really teaching. And I'm like, oh, how much? I'm like, I'm doing dividend reinvestment. I was like, how many, how many shares am I actually getting? Is this even worth it? And you actually see like over time that it is a couple of times when I actually had large position in some companies, I've actually gotten a couple of shares out of their dividend reinvestment. So um, it does work and it's, it's a long-term strategy. But anyway, so I had my Starbucks, I have like my, um, one of my favorite Oprah quotes because they were doing that for a while. And this is like an old picture, it's maybe from 2014, but um I absolutely love their um, their little sleeves they had going on a couple of years ago. Anyway, so that's my Starbucks. That's my dividend income. So if you own a stock that provides dividends, and not all stocks provide dividends, um, like Amazon doesn't provide dividends. Most tech stocks don't, but one of our favorite tech stocks it does, Apple. So again, Apple has like crazy growth recently and a really nice dividend. So with Apple, it's kind of like a win-win. And we'll talk about capital gains in a second. Let's go. All right. So before we even get into capital gains, what all the things that I talked to you about um, up until just now is all going to be taxed at your ordinary income rate. So your tax rates for 2020, I gave them to you. So basically, I'm not getting the way the taxes work because this is this is kind of like your what we call your marginal tax rate, and we actually have to calculate like your personal deduction. We also have to do a whole bunch of other things to get you to exactly how much you owe in taxes. So I'm not even doing this, but. If you make $100,000, you're probably going to be taxed somewhere between um, somewhere around 24% at some point um, where in your kind of tax bracket, um, your tax bracket is 24%, but how you're actually going to get that tax, if you're going to even fully be taxed 24%, it just depends on your income. It depends on a whole bunch of other things. So I just like to share that with you. Um, the reason why I share this kind of tax thing is that capital gains is completely different. If you hold a um, investment longer than a year, you're going to get what's considered the prefer preferred capital gains rate. And I'm going to talk about that right now. Okay, so income from capital gains. Capital, uh, uh, let me back up. So capital gains are a gain from a capital asset. And a capital asset is going to be your stocks, it's going to be your bonds, it's going to be your property, um, anything that you're basically holding for investment or potentially could hold for investment. But the most typical capital assets are going to be property and stock or bonds. So, um, and, and usually actually your bonds are going to be more considered interest income and not even capital gains. So we'll just stick with stock and property. So your capital assets, stock and property. Um, so a couple of years ago, I purchased Starbucks at like five, shares at, at like $78, but they had a split in 2015. So I've been holding Star, uh, Starbucks for a while. And now I'm like up maybe like 113%. So I basically double over doubled my money. Um, and this is in my retirement accounts, I believe. Like I care, but I'd like today I'm not like, oh my goodness, I care because of what's going on in my retirement account. Like I do care, but not like, oh, I need to use this money tomorrow. Um, but as you can see, I still, this is me again, having a Starbucks problem. But again, like I told you, I moved on to K-Cups, um, but still Starbucks nonetheless. Um, so I've shared this with you about like what is going on here, um, five shares, and then um, now it's 113%, um, percent, but it's in my retirement account, so it's not going to be taxed at the capital gains rate. It's not going to even be taxed at all until I take the money out. That's how the retirement accounts work. And I think I shot for probably talk about that. I talked about it a little bit before, but I think I probably need a full video. Y'all let me know in the show notes if you need a full video about how retirement accounts are taxed. Um, and then also you have property. So if you purchase, this is just an example, you purchase the property $100,000, you sold it at $175,000, you have a capital gain of $75,000. So let's look at this, capital gains. So short-term capital gains are going to be based on your ordinary income. So as you can see over here, I gave you your short-term capital gains, same things we've been talking about for all the other six streams of income. But here's the more, um, the more beneficial or the preferential 
long-term capital gains rate. Remember, if you hold an investment longer than a year, um, this is the rate that you're gonna be subject to. So if your income, if you have, um, if you make under, we'll say under $39,000, like again, all these numbers kind of, is not just this straightforward, but it's just an overview. If you make about $39,000 and say you maybe get like, I don't know, $1,000 in capital gains from something that you held, you make maybe 38, 35, and you get like $1,000 from capital gains, you're not going to get taxed on that. Like crazy, right? Like, huh. um, and now if you, um, now if you made $100,000 in your investments, your, um, if you made $100,000 in investments, you're going to get taxed at 15%. But if you make $100,000 in like real life, you're probably going to be taxed somewhere, I mean, depending on how much over $100,000 you make, somewhere between 24 and 32%. So that's huge. That's like almost half. You know, if I'm if I invest money, I can actually be taxed at almost half if I actually worked for the money. So you're telling me that my time is worth less, like should be taxed more than me just sitting there looking at the stock market or actually holding rental property, huh? But that's the way the tax code works. And I told you you have to learn the rules of the game and play it better than anyone else. So as you can see now, only at twenty, like I'm going to be taxed with capital gains if I make over 434,000. But again, I'm still like coming in 17% cheaper than if I actually made that money, or we'll say, maybe we'll say 15% cheaper, 15% cheaper, kind of starting there. Um, if I actually worked for the money, crazy, or I received it from others, some other source other than um, a long-term capital gain. So we have our ordinary we have our earned income, uh, dividend income, because dividend income is ordinary income, interest income, you know, um, royalty income, all of that is regular income at short-term cap, at short-term rates. I mean, I shouldn't say short-term rates. Let me back up. At your ordinary income tax rate. But dag, but if you are trading, I want to kind of put that in perspective. If you are trading, going in and out of the stock and you're making money, you're going to be taxed as ordinary income, but still like you're just kind of trading. You're not really, you know, <laughs> you're, you're not, um, you're not working, you know, you're not actively like, I don't know, playing around with your manager. Um, so I think it's a really different kind of experience, but once you learn like what taxes, um, you know, how the tax code works and what's going to be, I want to say, favored and disfavored in terms of the tax code, you can actually allocate your money better and be a better steward because then you know where to focus your money um, and focus your assets and resources. So kind of what I'm going to have in the show notes for you, always, if you always want to learn more about stocks or investing, I want to have that for you. But also if you want to learn about trading, my girlfriend, Tra Terry, does trading, um, trade with Terry, trade and travel, great program. I'll give you guys um, the link to her stuff too. And, um, and I'll also give you the ebook that's available um, for you guys to look a little bit more into uh, capital gains and basically the seven streams of income and understanding what they are and having like a little guide for yourself to kind of, you know, pace yourself and see what's going on. So thank you so much for joining me. Um, like I said, you have all this information in the show notes. Make sure that you subscribe and you follow and you uh, comment and like it. Thanks.